So the talk will be divided in three parts, as uh, was already announced in the, um, in the abstract. There will be one part uh, which will present an introduction to the EU, a very short one. Then we will talk about Galileo and satellite navigation. I understand most of you are engineers, so I hope you find that part uh, interesting. And then the third part will focus on uh, Galileo authentication, and in particular navigation message authentication, which is the let's say, the protocol that uh, we have uh, defined in cooperation with uh, Vincent and uh, Tomer. So let's start with the uh, introduction to the EU. So I just thought half joking, half uh, in, a tr in, a true, in the true sense that uh, uh, here you are, uh, you are working with security, with IT security, so you do security analysis. So when you do a security analysis, you, you have to understand what are the assets to protect, what are the threats, what are the mitigation actions that uh, you put in place? So the EU, as, as we know it, okay, it's a simplification, but there is some, some part of it. The asset to protect is Europe. The threats, you can consider the threats, the wars we have, have, we have had over the, the history of Europe, especially uh, if you think that the most peaceful period in the history of Europe is the, the period where the, the EU uh, exists, uh, you, can, you can see that there is some part of, true, uh, of truth in it. And then one mitigation against these wars. You have, as examples, the 30-year war, well, Napoleonic uh, wars, First World War and Second World War, as a mitigation action that for the moment it worked, is the EU. But the EU is not only that, it uh, also does uh, many other things. So uh, here is a very quick summary of the history of the EU since uh, just after the Second World War, where the European Coal and Steel uh, community was created with these uh, f six uh, founding members, Belgium uh, amongst them, uh, and that was created in order to manage the, uh, let's say, the frictions that uh, there were between uh, France and Germany that was defeated in World War II, especially regarding coal and steel because they were the very important resource very important resources required for the for the recovery on, of the industry in Europe in general so they created this uh, European coal and steel community and that uh, became the European uh, community in the Treaty of Rome in uh, 1957 uh, at that time uh, a common market was created for the first time and there was also the the, the Euratom which uh, was um, let's say um, um, uh, an, uh, an agreement in order to manage uh, nuclear and atomic um, energy. Then uh, there were many treaties, the Treaty of Maastricht that defined the European Union quite close to what, uh, what it is now, including the free uh, movement of people, goods, services and uh, money. And then there have been many treaties uh, later, the Treaty of Amsterdam, Nice, and uh, the last one, the Treaty of Lisbon. You can see uh, on, on the top, on the sorry, on the bottom left, uh, how countries have, at different times in the history of the EU, become part of the EU. Uh, I think the next uh, step will be to remove UK, unfortunately, but uh, it's not yet uh, there. So uh, very quickly, these are the main European institutions. Uh, so the main ones actually are the Parliament, the Council and the Commission. I work for the European Commission. The European Commission is the executive arm of the European Union, so we basically uh, write the, the regulations, we manage the funds and so on. The European Council represents the, the European Member States, so all the meetings with the ministers of the European Member States that get together to decide about Euro are generally well, they are part of the, or they are under the umbrella of the European Council, and then the European Parliament, uh, which uh, represents the, let's say, the will of the people through the members of the Parliament that are voted, as you know, in the next elections. Then you have a lot of, uh, let's say, second order uh, institutions, the Court of Justice, Court of Auditors, uh, Social and Economic Committee, Committee of Regions, uh, Investment Bank, uh, European Central, Central Bank and then agencies which are uh, spread uh, across Europe and they are in charge of uh, specific topics of the, of the EU. This is uh, more or less uh, how the uh, legal decisions are taken, how the legal is, uh, how, how the law is, um, is implemented. Uh, so first of all, there, there is discussion and, and consultation with uh, citizens, uh, interest groups and experts. Uh, as a result of that, the European Commission drafts a proposal of law. This proposal of law is uh, discussed with the Parliament and the Council. 
and uh, jointly decided. And then once uh, it is a piece of law, it becomes uh, an official piece of law in the European um, uh, journal. And then it is implemented, it is transcribed into national uh, and local uh, uh, laws uh, as corresponds. And then once it's implemented, the European Commission and the Court of Justice monitor how the law is implemented, in particular if it is implemented correctly by, by the member states. This is a summary of how the legislative process works. It is important because around three-fourths of the, of the law that uh, govern our lives come from the EU. Uh, maybe many of the things are not the most important, but uh, yet in terms of quantity it is a lot. Uh, member states they retain uh, key competencies fully as a fiscal policy, as you know, defense and many others. Just to give you uh, an overview of uh, the economic part uh, of the EU, the budget is around, uh, well, somewhat more than 100 billion euro per year. Uh, in particular, in 2017, 137 billion euro. And uh, this represents, uh, in average, 2% uh, of the national budgets of the member states that is given to the EU. So it's a relatively uh, small part. So uh, before finishing, uh, one of the questions that people ask and uh, sometimes they don't uh, fully you know, understand is what is the EU doing for us? No? I wanted to put uh, this, uh, this sentence uh, very well known from, uh, from Kennedy ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. But nevertheless, there are lots of things that the EU uh, is doing for citizens, lots of laws that apply us directly. And if you want to take a closer look, you can check this website. And then with this and this uh, picture, I'm done with, uh, with the campaigning for the EU. And then we start with a real presentation. So um, I will, as I said before, I will talk about uh, Galileo and satellite navigation in general, and then about Galileo authentication. Um, I don't know how you proceed with questions. If the audience can interrupt, uh, I have no inconvenience in being interrupted whenever you want, but uh, as you prefer. So uh, we start with, uh, with Galileo, and before Galileo, we start with satellite navigation. And uh, one interesting fact of satellite navigation, it is that it starts with, uh, with satellite technologies. So uh, as you know, 4th of October uh, 1957, Sputnik is launched. And uh, <coughs> some weeks later, the Johns Hopkins sorry, uh, Physics Lab in the US uh, determines how the position of uh, Sputnik can be computed. And uh, they propose to use the Doppler variations in the signal in order to uh, compute uh, its position. So you have here an animation of that. So you have the satellite following one of its uh, orbits. Uh, and you can see that depending on where you are, if you are in A, B, or C, you will see a different uh, Doppler uh, frequency signature. I think you are familiar, you are engineers, you are familiar with Doppler effect, so there is no need to, uh, to explain it further. The Sputnik was sending a tone of about 20 megahertz, and depending on where, wh where you were, you would see a different signature. You would see an abrupt transition if the satellite is going over you, uh, let's say smoother transition or an even smoother transition the farthest you go. So with this and some orbital mechanics, you can compute the satellite orbit. This is the principle of satellite navigation. In this uh, case, it was used to compute the position of the satellite, but then someone thought that if you uh, transmit the position of the satellite, you can uh, use the reverse uh, method, but based on the same principle in order to compute your own uh, position. So this, uh, this became uh, a system called the transit in the 60s, and then uh, over the decades we have evolved until satellite navigation as we know it uh, today. Satellite navigation as we know it today, it's not based on Doppler primarily, it's based on time of arrival. So you have satellites transmitting a signal, it, they are transmitting also their position and a time reference, and then a receiver is able to compute uh, or to get four measurements from four satellites, and with these four measurements it's able to um, uh, to determine its uh, three-dimensional uh, position and time. Uh, one, you know, one question that we often have is uh, why, don't, uh, why is it necessary to have a fourth satellite? The reason is that uh, when you compute 
When you compute your position, you need to compute the time of arrival. You know when the signal departed from the satellite, and you know when it uh, is received in your receiver, but according to your receiver time. And your receiver time is not accurate, because you would need an atomic clock for that. And in order to account for the time offset in your receiver, you need uh, a fourth satellite that solves this uh, fourth uh, unknown, which uh, appears in all, the, uh, in all the measurements. I don't know if, uh, well, I think I can manage without, uh, without a pointer, but uh, anyway, here you can see the, the equations. So what we want to know is the, the x, y, z, the hero, the, uh, zero, sorry, that appears here, and the bias. So these are the, the four equations that we have. These are the measurements that we take in our receiver, and then there are some linearization processes that uh, are applied, uh, basically you use um, Taylor series to linearize the equations and calculate uh, your position. So this is the, the principle of, uh, of satellite navigation, as we know it now. Um, it has uh, an enormous amount of applications. Um, we have spoken a lot over the last years about how useful GNSS is, how many applications there are. I think this is all well known by now, so I don't think I have to insist. Uh, it applies to transport, it applies to agriculture, defense and security, of course, energy, syn uh, synchronization of grids, for example, communications, banking, etc. So it's not only uh, the GPS you have in your smartphones, but uh, much more. So when on, well, as you know, the, the main uh, satellite navigation system is GPS, and in fact, when we refer to satellite navigation, we refer to GPS in general. Nevertheless, there are uh, other uh, systems, not only uh, Galileo, there is the Russian system GLONASS, the Chinese system Beidou, the 3 al military, and then Galileo, as you know, which is, uh, which is a civilian system. It, uh, it makes a difference because, uh, well, we may have a bit more of overhead and uh, slowness in our decision process compared to the military. On the other hand, even if uh, Galileo can be used and will be used for military and governmental applications, its priority is on the civil side. And that you can see in the services that we offer. One of uh, them is the Galileo authentication we are going to talk about uh, later. Uh, one important question is uh, why uh, should Europe do Galileo? Well, uh, there is an obvious reason, which is that otherwise you depend on the, on the other systems. And, Gali and the satellite navigation nowadays is, uh, is a commodity. It's a commodity like water, like uh, electricity, uh, like internet, and it doesn't look a very good idea geopolitically to depend on water or electricity uh, from the Department of Defense of the United States. So there are so many implications that it makes sense that uh, Europe develops their own system, and uh, this has been the case also uh, for, for China and Russia, as you can see. And there are many other regions that are developing their systems, not uh, globally, but regionally. So India, for example, they have a regional system, Japan has a regional system, and others are working on regional systems too. So when we design a SATNAV system, what are our design criteria? What are our priorities? So as you can imagine, the first, the first one, or the most important one, that uh, may come to our mind is uh, accuracy. So we want a system that is accurate, that gives us our position uh, as accurate as possible. This is quite obvious. But then another one that is not so obvious is time to fix. This is a very relevant uh, driver because when you switch on your receiver, it uh, generally takes a while until uh, you get the fix. Now with assisted GNSS, you can get it instantaneously, but if you rely only on the signals, this can take up to 30 seconds or more. So this is a very important criterion for uh, GNSS uh, design. Uh, now you could say that most of the receivers are assisted as smartphones, but uh, there is a part of receivers that are not assisted. And uh, this, let's say, percentage of, uh, of the uh, of the receivers, even if it is small in uh, relative terms, it is very big in, al in absolute terms. So this is a very important uh, design criteria. Availability is also very important because we are assuming now that uh, GPS or GNSS works everywhere. In fact, it works everywhere because it has been designed to have enough satellites uh, on our heads everywhere. But uh, this is a design criterion that, uh, that is also relevant, uh, especially if you take into account that, na that nowadays we use GNSS more and more in cities and urban canyons and so on where there are less satellites. So how you, develop, uh, how you design and develop your constellation so that you have always enough satellites is an important criterion. There are some limitations, as for example, the signals are uh, very weak. They cannot penetrate buildings. So, for example, here it would be 
not very obvious that uh, that you could get a position. I don't know what is up there, but it depends on uh, on what is up there, how many layers you could get uh, the signal even if attenuated. It also depends on what comes out of uh, these windows. Even if uh, the signal has multipath, uh, you can you can get something. But uh, we don't we know it doesn't work uh, indoors well. Uh, this is an inherent limitation, but uh, nevertheless we have to maximize availability in all other places. Then there are, uh, there are other costs. Authenticity is uh, one we are going to talk about uh, later. Integrity is very important because it is the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the uh, assurance that uh, what uh, your system is telling you is correct. Because if it is correct 99% uh, of the time, but the 1% of the time that it is wrong, it tells you that you are 200 meters away, you have an integrity problem. You cannot, for example, land planes with that. So this is also an important uh, design criterion. And then con continuity and resilience. So you not only have to have a system that is available, but have to have a system that is, uh, that is not interrupted every now and then. And this is also relevant for some operations. And then, of course, the cost. Uh, now we, talk, uh, we will talk uh, briefly about uh, the principles of GNSS. GNSS nowadays is based on CDMA signals, co-division multiple access. Uh, basically, the signals are, um, are designed in a way that uh, each uh, satellite transmits in the same uh, frequency. And in order to discern what is the signal that you are getting, the signal uh, on the carrier frequency has a, what we call a pseudo-random uh, uh, sequence that is unique per satellite. And then in order to process one satellite, you correlate, you create a replica in your receiver and you correlate the signal with the replica. And this replica has the PRN. So if you correlate with the right PRN, you will have a peak and this peak will allow you to track the signal and to tell you the time of arrival of that signal. This is more or less the way it works. So you can see there that the signal includes uh, the data that tells where the satellite is and, uh, and the synchronization, so the, the satellite time. It tells the, the PRN uh, code that we set before. And uh, then you modulate the, the two things and then you, uh, you transmit them in the carrier. And this is basically the GPS signals uh, that we process in our, in our smartphones are basically like that. Now, in order to have the ranging signal, in order to compute the time of arrival, as I said, you create the replica and then uh, you move the replica over time in order to uh, find the correlation peak. When you find the correlation peak, you know the time that the signal took to travel uh, from the satellite uh, to the receiver plus the receiver clock offset, as we said before. And with four of those, you can, in principle, calculate your position. The problem with that is that this uh, signal has a very, let's say, winding uh, road between it is transmitted from the satellite and it arrives uh, at the receiver. There are many errors you have to uh, tackle. One error is the satellite clock offset, starting with, uh, with the top uh, part. Uh, the satellite clock offset is provided by the satellite itself because it is calculated on ground, and then the ground tells the satellite, and the satellite tells us, I have a little offset of, uh, I don't know, a couple of, uh, microseconds, for example. But nevertheless, this offset is not perfect, and uh, you have to uh, account for an error for that. Um, there are rela relativistic effects in the clock corrections because the satellites are moving at a speed that is, let's say, considerably uh, fast and has an impact already, uh, or let's say, you can see the effect of the special relativity because of the uh, speed of the, of the satellite. On the other hand, the satellite has a lower gravitational potential, so it also, due to the general relativity, there is an effect of that, so you have to correct that. Then uh, there are instrumental delays in the satellite. Uh, you have then the geometric range, which is in the order of 20-something uh, 20, 20 thousand kilometers. Then you have uh, the signal travels uh, through the ionosphere. In the ionosphere, you can have a delay of uh, between 2 and 30 meters. The troposphere, you can have also between 2 and 30 meters. Then you have the receiver clock offset, receiver instrumental delay. And this is what you measure. So what you measure is full of errors. And one of the main tasks of uh, SatNav engineers is to correct these errors as best as possible, because otherwise they will be translated into your uh, position. Um, we talked about the clocks before. Uh, we have to have accurate uh, clocks on board. There, I won't enter in the details, but there you can see the two types of clocks that we have in Galileo satellites. The passive hydrogen masser, or PHM, 
and uh, the rubidium uh, atomic clock. We, har we have two of each, so we have four clocks in each satellite, and they provide a stability that is uh, extremely high, uh, so that uh, you have uh, very, very small offsets, even if you are correcting them, but you have very, very small time shifts in, in your clock in the order of, for example, one nanosecond every three hours in the case of the GSM, of the PHM, sorry. Um, we have to remember that uh, one nanosecond is uh, 30 centimeters, so one nanosecond of error would uh, yield an error of 30 centimeters in the user position. So it is very important that the timing uh, is, is done perfectly on GNSS. So now we will talk about uh, Galileo. Uh, here you can see the ground uh, segment where the stations are deployed. It is a global system, so we have to have stations globally because we have to monitor what the satellites are doing. So we have to uh, monitor them wherever they are. Uh, that means we have between 14 and 16 uh, monitoring stations. And then we have uh, some uh, uplink stations, five uplink stations that uh, uplink the data, so where the satellites are, orbits, uh, and so on. The clock data, also some IONO model for correcting the ionosphere and other uh, flags and other data, and all this is up, up linked uh, from uh, five stations close to the equator. This, these are the ones with, uh, with the, big the big blue antennas there, the ULSs. And then you have stations for telemetry and tracking. So uh, in order to, for example, tell the satellite that uh, it has to correct slightly its orbit, it uh, has to, uh, I don't know, do some maintenance operation, whatever, uh, you have uh, another type of uh, antennas and another type of, let's say, chain logical chain that, uh, that is in charge of that. And uh, the ensemble of this infrastructure is what you can see there. You have also some control centers. There are two of them. We call them GCCs, and they are in Fucino, Italy, and over Pfaffenhofen, Germany. Here, you can see uh, pictures of, uh, of the different elements. So for example, this is the telemetry antenna. It's the biggest of the system. This is the Fucino uh, control center. This is one uh, GSS, one monitoring uh, antenna. Uh, these are the ULS, the uplink, uh, uplink antennas, and this is the Redu uh, in orbit testing, which is very close to here. I don't know if you, you have visited it. Uh, there is a space center, I think, in, uh, in the area, in the Ardennes, and uh, very, very close is the, the Redu center. And uh, when we launch new satellites, uh, we do some testing before the satellites are declared operational and uh, part of the testing is done from there. Uh, now let's talk about the constellation. Um, GNSS use uh, MEO orbits, so we don't use uh, low Earth orbits because we would need a lot of satellites. We don't use uh, geostationary uh, orbits because uh, we would have a we would have to transmit at a higher power and we wouldn't cover the poles well so therefore uh, the optimal let's say the sweet spot is on uh, medium earth orbit in particular medium earth orbit for us means in the order of 20000 to uh, 23000 um, altitude for uh, for our satellites galileo is in the as you can see there in the 23200 uh, Galileo constellation is a Walker, Walker constellation. It has, sorry, it has 24 satellites in three orbital planes that you can see in the picture there, uh, and uh, with a phase in between planes of uh, 15 degrees. So these parameters is what gives you the Walker 2431, let's say, identification of the constellation, which is the which is what defines what the, what the constellation actually is. In addition to that, there are spare satellites. At the moment, we have uh, 22 satellites uh, already uh, flying, so we are completing the constellation. We expect completion, what we call full operational capability, by end 2020. But the system is already there. It is already operational, even if in its initial phase, and you can use it. Now, looking at the satellites, um, this is a, a Galileo satellite. The launch configuration is what you can see up there. So the, the wings, they are uh, folded. Uh, and then you can see uh, the satellite when uh, the wings are unfolded. It uh, weights uh, 730 kilos. Uh, we say that uh, it is more or less what a Renault Twingo weights. So you can kind of imagine it. And then you can see the span which is 14.5 uh, uh, meters. Um, 
This is the accuracy that uh, we have got over the last uh, years uh, in the Galileo ranging signal. So all these errors that I was talking about, they are corrected to yield a total error of uh, 0.4 uh, meters, 95% in average. This is very low because GPS is now to our uh, knowledge at 0.6 or something like that. So in terms of accuracy, even if we have less satellites, we can say that per signal at the moment we are uh, better than, uh, than GPS. It doesn't count that much because uh, you as users don't care whether the signal is uh, 0.4 or 0.6 uh, meters. You care that the overall system works and we have to say that GPS works extremely well and we are happy to, to cooperate with them. There is a lot of uh, cooperation going on in order not to, it, not to interfere each other, to develop complementary services and so on. So there is no competition. But that being said, Galileo is at the moment more accurate. Right, so in terms of uh, cost, uh, so I came here to explain uh, what the EU does, why the EU is good for, uh, for us uh, as citizens. Uh, then when you think that as part of our taxes uh, you are paying the system that is doing the same thing as EPS, you may think, okay, this is very good, but uh, do we really need it? Uh, can, can we spend uh, our taxpayers' money doing something uh, cheaper or doing something more useful. One thing to bear in mind is that Galileo, even if we spend about 1 billion euro per year, which is a lot of uh, money, uh, if you put it uh, in context compared to the budget of the EU and the budget of the member states, it is a low amount. Uh, it is less than 1% of the EU budget. And we said before that the EU budget was around 2% in average of uh, the budget of the member states. So you can, uh, you can calculate that in average Galileo represents 0.02% uh, of the, let's say, uh, the, the, national, the national budget of the, let's say, what you are paying, uh, mainly what you are paying, citizens, companies and so on from your taxes. So it is a very low amount for what it offers. And uh, <coughs> another thing to bear in mind is that uh, this money is not burned. This money is reverted into the society by uh, employing uh, highly skilled people, developing know-how that is strategic uh, for Europe and so on. We are not saying there, are nothing, there, are n there is nothing to improve, there is a lot to improve and we hope uh, over time we improve it, but, uh, but nevertheless it is important to highlight that uh, it is something that makes sense, that is not so expensive and that is strategic. So this is all about Galileo. Um, I was planning now to move to Galileo authentication and, uh, and then explain uh, briefly the cryptographic uh, functions uh, that, uh, that we are using, why we are doing Galileo authentication and so on. So starting as at the beginning of the presentation, uh, what are the threats and why are we doing uh, Galileo authentication? Why are we doing GNSS authentication at all? The reason is very simple and it is that uh, if you think about it, satellite navigation data is one of the few data that you use nowadays that is not yet authenticated. Most of the data that you use, or a lot of uh, data that you use that is digital, that you get from whatever uh, source, has some means of authentication. GNSS does not at the moment. It only has for the military. And we have lived in the GNSS community with this uh, vulnerability since the beginning. So now we are waking up and we are looking at ways to mitigate uh, this, uh, this threat. Uh, how does this manifest in uh, practical terms, in, in real life? Fortunately, we don't see a lot of uh, spoofing events or spoofing events that are life-threatening. But nevertheless, we, we are starting to see a lot. Uh, one of the, let's say, one of the turning points has been, uh, surprisingly, Pokemon Go. So uh, Pokemon Go is the main gaming application that uh, has location as a component of it. Uh, and we have seen that there is a lot of interest in spoofing GPS for playing Pokemon Go, for getting this little stuff that you get if you are in a certain place. Uh, for example, I just uh, uh, did a quick search in, in YouTube before coming here uh, and I filtered the results of GPS spoofing that I got in the last week. And, you, see, and, and uh, you can do it and you can see that there are really a lot of uh, new entries just in the last week, some of them with tens of thousands of, uh, of visits. There is a lot of interest in, uh, in GPS spoofing. 
But gaming is not the only threat. Uh, there are many threats, uh, either intentional or non-intentional, that uh, we are seeing and that require protecting the signal. So uh, if you look at safety of life uses of uh, GNSS, aviation for example, you cannot afford that the plane that is taking off where you are in or the plane that is uh, landing where you are in is spoofed. Because if it's spoofed, uh, it can lead to a hazardous, uh, I mean, it, it can create a lot of risk. It can, it can even uh, make crash the plane. But uh, these risks are, are happening uh, at the moment. I don't want to scare you, you can continue flying. They are, there are very specific events and they, they didn't lead to a, what we call hazard, hazardously misleading uh, information. There are other protection means, but the risk is there. One of them is uh, there was a repeater in a Hanover airport in 2010. This is just an example. There have been others like that. And uh, you had a plane that was departing with the wrong uh, position from the repeater. This was an in, a non-intentional threat, but just happened. And, uh, and uh, fortunately, nothing happened. So the plane could depart, but uh, the GPS was wrong. And we are seeing more and more and more of that. Uh, another uh, threat that is non-intentional but uh, very dangerous is that uh, you, can, you can have a lab, you can synthesize a GNSS-like signal and uh, you can relatively easily transmit it to a satellite that is broadcasting this signal in a, in a footprint that can cover, in the case of a geosatellite, one-third of the Earth. So you can have a signal that is GNSS-like, that is processed by all the receivers in this footprint, uh, and that is not correct, and that is misleading the receiver. This is something that can happen if there is no authentication, if there is no way to protect the, the signal, to tell that the signal is coming from the true, short, tr from the true uh, uh, source. Another problem that we have is that uh, the RF regulation uh, falls uh, uh, in the, into the competence of member states. So we cannot uh, tell, as the European Commission, we cannot force member states to um, not transmit this or transmit that. So therefore, we have to protect our system within our own uh, system. There is a lot of, uh, uh, there are lots of publications on uh, GNSS spoofing. In particular, Texas Austin University has been very active. They were the f one of the first, but since then there has been a lot. Even we ourselves have done some, some research on that. And uh, we see that uh, it is demonstrated, there is no doubt, that the attacks are very easy to perform if the GNSS is not authenticated. And then one thing we don't know is uh, what is happening that is not reported. I didn't put in this slide the recent uh, events, maybe you have heard in, um, in Finland, in Norway, and uh, in uh, places where uh, uh, Russian President Putin is traveling, but it is apparently very common that wherever he is traveling, all the area is, uh, is spoofed. So there is really something going on, and, uh, and uh, w this is why we are doing something. Another important, uh, another important element, and uh, I wanted to, to rescue this slide that I didn't uh, use for a while, uh, particularly because I took this picture from a presentation by Bart Prenel some, some years ago. I asked uh, um, uh, permission uh, to, um, to Vincent, uh, it was okay, so I thought it was a good occasion to kind of put it back. Uh, is that uh, location, well, location is key for the economy at the moment. So 6% of the EU uh, GDP depends, it's estimated to depend on, on location. But not only that, location is also a way of uh, authentication. So you can use uh, location for trust, but only if your location can be trusted. So as an example of that, uh, there is this, uh, this figure where you can see the, the fraud in uh, payments and that a uh, big part of them uh, are what, what is called car not uh, present events. So they were not uh, in, the, um, in the ATM, but uh, they were other type of transactions where the car was not present. If you add a location authentication to that, you can probably prevent many of this, uh, of this uh, fraud. So location, uh, so trusted location for adding location as a, as a means of trust, this is the idea. Now uh, I will briefly go into the detail of, uh, a bit more detail of, uh, of Galileo, of the Galileo signals, Galileo frequencies and services and uh, where we are adding authentication. So just to, uh, to recall, I talked before about how the signals are modulated. You have the carrier here, you have the spreading code that allows you to synchronize to one satellite and not to the others. Uh, and then what you do when you want to encrypt a signal 
is you multiply the spreading code with a key stream generated with a key, chip by chip or bit by bit if you like, and then you, uh, you uh, modulate the data onto it and then you transmit it. This is what we call spreading code encryption. Uh, or spreading code authentication. Of course, encryption and authentication is not the same, but for the purpose of this, this is part, this in particular is spreading code encryption, actually. Then, um, navigation message authentication, which is the core of the next slides, is just authenticating uh, the data stream that we are transmitting. So we transmit this data in the signals that tell, as I said before, where the satellites are, uh, what is the time reference, uh, of the satellites and of the system and other relevant information necessary to compute your position. So if this data is not uh, authenticated and the spoofer can change it, then it will change your position. So we are, we are focusing on these two features of the signals and we are starting with this one, with NMA. In particular, regarding where we are transmitting this, here you have two of the three frequencies that Galileo is transmitting. The main one is this one. The, uh, the E1 or L1, this is the one you use in your uh, smartphones. More and more they are starting to use others, but uh, for the moment this is the standard and this is where GPS lies. So we are transmitting in the same frequency and it will be in this frequency that we will add uh, navigation message authentication. Then uh, these signals are, uh, mul let's say, multiplied in quadrature as we call it, sorry with uh, the military signal components that go here, but this is a domain where we don't, uh, don't enter. But uh, these military signals, they also have uh, encryption and, uh, and authentication. One thing to consider about encryption is that um, generally when you encrypt something is for confidentiality reasons, but uh, in the case of SatNav, there is no need for, for confidentiality because the, the, the information that we are transmitting so the signal will be will be seen anyway. So uh, we are more in. So our priority is to to provide authentication to the signal, not to. So the confidentiality element is not uh, not relevant. Let's say, especially in the civil domain. But I will talk more about later, about that later. Um, one thing uh, that is is interesting to to tell is that um, uh, there is a you know a long history of a Galileo authentication, but not as long as Galileo itself, because Galileo initially did not foresee any authentication. And it has been uh, through a tremendous effort of, uh, of some of us that uh, we have been able to add, um, to add authentication to the Galileo baseline that uh, did not, uh, did not uh, include it initially. So um, we started uh, around 2013. I see Boris, uh, who was uh, one of our colleagues working at GSA at the time, then he wisely uh, left the Galileo program to do something elsewhere, but, um, but uh, ever since I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to announce, not announce, uh, to report here that there has been some progress, even if slow, but uh, some progress. Very hard for this application. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So finally, we are, we are almost there. Not yet there, but almost there. So uh, we started around 2013 doing feasibility analysis on uh, what we could do to make Galileo better, because the Galileo specification had been defined uh, a long time ago, and the lead times in Galileo and satellite navigation are very, very, um, you know, very slow. So therefore, when we were closer to, you know, starting transmitting something, we realized that that uh, it was perhaps not what, uh, what the users needed and there were not so many differentiators compared to GPS. So we found ourselves in a situation where we wanted to transmit a, what we call a safety of life service, but then this service was decoupled because it was not really what, uh, what the users needed. So we, we found ourselves with an infrastructure designed for this service, but uh, without the service. So we did the exercise of what can, what can we put in the signals to replace the safety of life service that is useful for the users. And the answer is in these three points. The high accuracy service that uh, we are working on now and uh, will be offered for free. It was initially foreseen for a fee, but it will be offered for free. So that means, even if it's not part of this presentation, that Galileo in the next couple of years will offer a service that goes much beyond the accuracy offered by, by GPS and Galileo nowadays and will will enter into a level of accuracy in the position of around 20 centimeters. Before, when we were talking about uh, 40 centimeters, half a meter or so in accuracy, we were talking about accuracy of the ranging signal under some conditions. But if you translate that to the user accuracy, that gives you in good visibility conditions an accuracy in the order of one, two meters, 
something like that, which is generally what you get in your smartphone. So what we are talking here is about an accuracy in the order of 20 centimeters in the user. The second uh, service is OSNMA that I will talk about later and the third one is what we call now commercial authentication service which is not only the data authentication but also the signal authentication which is more robust. So as I said before it has been a difficult process, it has been somewhat like jumping on a moving train which is Galileo but finally we jumped into the train and, uh, and the train is, is moving forward. So now we will talk more explicitly, more specifically about uh, Galileo uh, navigation message authentication. So when we decided that uh, we wanted to explore the addition of, uh, of authentication to Galileo, uh, we looked at uh, what were our service definition drivers. So how, what, what is Galileo, uh, what are the features of Galileo with respect to other, um, other systems where you want to add uh, uh, some level of security or where, where you want to add cryptography. So from the, let's say, from the cryptographic point of view, maybe more related to your, um, your domain of, uh, of interest and expertise, uh, first of all, it is an open access system. We are not, uh, we are not uh, in the case where you have uh, Alice and Bob that uh, have to communicate through, a, uh, that have to transmit a secret from one another. We, are, we have an open access system. We are just transmitting something from one source to many, uh, many receivers. So this uh, naturally leads to asymmetric uh, cryptography. We have a, a communication channel of one to many and one way. There is no return from the users to the satellites. It is just the satellite transmitting the information of the signal allowing the ranging and the signal telling where the satellite is to all the users. Um, the channel is very noisy and it has a very low bandwidth. I didn't say it before, but it appeared in the slides. The power of the the power that the satellite manages is in the order of 2,000 uh, watt, like a microwave. But uh, the power that is transmitted by the antenna is is uh, in the order of, uh, depending on how you measure it, but around 50 watt. So something like a like a small bulb, uh, and uh, with this power, the signals. Uh, arrive at a very, very low power on Earth, in particular at a 10 to the minus, six, minus 16 watt. So uh, that means that uh, they, you know, the signal is very weak it and it can arrive with errors. Even if our bandwidth is low, because bandwidth of Galileo or Genesis signals is in the order of 50 to 200 bits per second, nothing to do with uh, broadband uh, systems, uh, even at that bandwidth, it is very difficult to transmit information. There is a lot of noise. There is multipad, there are all the effects we said before, IONO, TROPO, and so on. So this has to be accounted for. It has to be also uh, cryptographically secure for the long term, because as we said, the lead times in Galileo are very, uh, very long. So you design something and then you put it uh, in the satellites um, years later, you declare it operational years later, so you have to take into account that uh, the system has to be secure once it is in operation. So you have to take some margins, it has to be cryptographically secure in the long term. Not the only one, but uh, it is one of the drivers we have to take into account. It has to be backward compatible because uh, there are some users that may not be interested in authentication. Even if we are talking so much about the benefits of it, it may not be for everyone. So we don't want to add the protocol in a way that uh, makes the receivers that are functioning today, not functioning anymore. So it has to be uh, backward compatible. And it, uh, finally, it has to be commensurate with uh, the requirements of the receiver. Uh, it has to be, so the authentication uh, functions running in the receiver have to uh, consume an amount of CPU that is affordable for a, for a smartphone, for a receiver uh, in a car or whatever. The same applies for the memory, the same applies for connectivity, so GNSS, generally does not require a connection. If you have a connection and you do assisted GNSS, it works better, but if you don't have, it has to work. And the, the level of protection that you need in the receiver has to be commensurate with, uh, with your target receivers. You cannot, uh, for example, ask for anti-tampering measures that are uh, not state of the art for a receiver you can have in your pocket. So th these were mainly the service definition drivers that uh, we took into account for uh, defining uh, OSNMA. Another relevant part of, uh, of the translation of authentication uh, to the satellite navigation domain is that what do we mean with authentication? So when you authenticate data, it is relatively 
easy to to define what you are authenticating. You authenticate an entity, for example, that um, a person, for example, is, is uh, whoever he says he is, or you authenticate some data or the origin of, uh, of some data. That is something you usually do in, uh, in, um, in cryptography, but uh, how can you authenticate a location? It is not so easy because, as, as we said before, the location depends on the data, so that is no problem, but it also depends on the range. And the range depends on what the satellite transmits and when it transmits it, and also the measurement that you get in the receiver. So authenticating this is not uh, easy, especially if you take into account that uh, a spoofer can just replay a signal somewhere in between so that the receiver can get a signal that is exactly as the, uh, the authentic one, but replayed. Replay attacks are also common, I mean, they are common in, in, in cryptography, but here the problem is that a replay attack affects the position that you get, so affects the, the service as, as much as anything else. So this is something we have to deal with. Um, that means that uh, a way to prevent uh, or to improve range authentication is to uh, protect against replay, is to, first of all, add unpredictability, so the signal cannot be advanced, because now the signals from GPS, they are totally repeatable. So you can just play with the data, you can play with the range, and you can do whatever you want. If you add some unpredictability that is later verified, which is a property that, that you get from, for example, whatever means of authentication, then you can only, you only care about the signal not being uh, replayed because the signal cannot be advanced. Uh, and then, if you care only about replay, you can add some anti-replay checks. And then you enter in the signal processing domain it's not the purpose of uh, today's uh, presentation, but uh, but uh, with signal processing techniques, you can you can ensure to a certain level of uh, let's say confidence and under certain conditions that if that your signal is not replayed. So finally, if your signal is not advanced, not replayed, and your data is correct, you can ensure that your position is authentic. But as you see, it's not as easy as uh, as data authentication. So. There are two families of, uh, as we call them, uh, of authentication in GNSS. Because as we said before, there are two main parts of the signal that are modulated on the carrier, the data and the code. So NMA affects the data only, and, uh, and this is one of the families. And uh, spreading code authentication, or SCA, affects uh, the code. We have started with NMA, uh, first of all, because it is easy to do, because we can change the bits that go in the satellites, but we cannot easily change the, the signal itself and, uh, and we cannot easily encrypt the codes. And uh, also because NMA can protect uh, to a big extent against uh, ranging attacks. It can protect against uh, advanced attacks and it can protect against replay as well. So now we will talk about, about the protocol in a bit more detail. So uh, this is the structure of the navigation message of Galileo. So every 30 seconds, if your receiver is receiving a Galileo signal, it will get this sequence of data. And in this sequence of data, you get the satellite orbits, you get the clocks, you get the IONO corrections, and so on. And then there is one small field here, which is, uh, well, now it is called OSNMA field. It was called Reserved 1 before, uh, that provides 40 bits every other second. And it is in this field that we are adding OSNMA. And we are, add uh, we are adding it, uh, uh, through a protocol, that is the Tesla protocol, time-deficient stream loss-tolerant authentication, um, that we have adapted for GNSS uh, to provide authentication. So Tesla, I don't know to which extent you are familiar with it, you, some of you may know it, it is based on uh, the generation of a, of a chain of keys through a one-way function, um, the transmission of the root key, uh, of the chain, that is the last element of the chain, um, through another scheme so that you ensure that the receiver has this root key, and then the authentication of the data you want to authenticate through a message authentication code that uses a key of the chain that is disclosed later. So what you get um, from Galileo is uh, you get the navigation data you want to authenticate, you get the MAC, then after a while you get the key. When you get the key, if you haven't, uh, so yeah, you authenticate it with a root key. 
So you ensure that the key is authentic, then uh, you check the navigation and the key, and then uh, if, that, uh, if, if the outcome of that is the Mac that you just got, you can authenticate uh, the, the navigation. There are some nuances there, because you are not only authenticating the navigation, but you are also adding some counters, some, some salts uh, here and there, also in the key generation, but this is essentially the, um, the way the protocol uh, uh, is implemented. One very important requirement for the receiver is that uh, in order to avoid replay attacks where the attacker waits to get the key and then falsifies the navigation, is that you need a loose time synchronization in the receiver. This loose time synchronization is in the order of seconds, can be up to some minutes, uh, depending on what parts of the protocol uh, you use, because there are Macs that are more distant to the key than, than others in order to have flexibility for different users. Um, and this is basically the way the way it, it uh, works. Tesla protocol applied uh, to satellite navigation. One of the problems that we have is that, uh, well, as you know, we have several transmitters, up to four. So one of the small modifications with respect to the standard protocol is that we use the same key for all uh, satellites. So um, the Macs that are transmitted by all satellites can be authenticated with the keys that are transmitted by all uh, satellites. So you can get the key from one satellite and then authenticate the Macs from the other. So you augment, you increase uh, availability uh, significantly. Actually, for uh, every authentication, you only need... Uh, no, actually, for four satellites authentication, you only need an, an additional 200 bits. So imagine if you wanted to authenticate four satellites with four digital signatures, because you cannot do easily one digital signature because you never know what, satelli what satellites a user are seeing. So imagine that you sign, I don't know, these four satellites, but then this receiver happens not to receive uh, satellites one to four, but one to five. Then it wouldn't do anything with the digital signature. So in principle, uh, you need to digitally sign the data from uh, each satellite. So you can, you can you know, calculate how many data you would need, how many bits you would need to sign the data of uh, each and every satellite with a level of security that is uh, acceptable nowadays. And given that uh, that uh, bandwidth is uh, scarce in satellite navigation, and given that adding bandwidth reduces your availability because you can have errors, then you see that one of the drivers that we have is to minimize the number of bits that you have to receive in order to have a, a data authenticated position. And now we are in the order of 200 bits. And uh, then another feature is that, uh, well, as I said before, due to this uh, use of the key, uh, interchangeable use of the keys and Macs, you can do what we call cross-authentication, which is that with the data from one satellite, you can authenticate the data of others. And by the way, that allows us to authenticate the data from GPS, which is part of the current uh, specification. <coughs> um, so these are the main features uh, of uh, NMA as it stands now in terms of uh, cryptographic functions uh, used. Uh, I have to thank uh, Vincent and Kosik because um, the choice of the cryptographic uh, functions has been made, uh, taking into account, uh, well, discussing directly with uh, with Kosik, taking into account th directly their recommendations. So this is this that you can see in this slide is a is a result of a work by uh, by this group by this university. Coming back to the Tesla. Uh, the chain of keys is generated with, uh, with SHA-256, it can also be generated with SHA-3 in two different, sorry, two different implementations. Uh, then uh, the keys are truncated from 256 to something between 90 and 128 bits. We have analyzed uh, thoroughly with Vincent, with Tomer as well, what is the right size of, uh, of the keys that we can afford uh, to, um, uh, to prevent uh, or to, to minimize the probability of, uh, uh, of a collision to an extent that is, uh, that is acceptable and uh, we have confirmed that these numbers are okay. Then regarding the tags or the max, we use HMAC or CMAC and the max are truncated to between 10 and 32 bits. This is an important, uh, an important feature because normally max are, uh, are longer but in our case we understand that uh, the, uh, that an attacker will have no ch no no uh, let's say opportunity because it, the attacker is not generating any information. So the the only opportunity it has to guess a Mac is to forge the navigation and expect 
that the Mac will uh, will be the same as uh, will be the same for the forged uh, navigation. So uh, we we can we can have a low probability of that happening uh, with a very short uh, tax uh, from ten. Uh, from 10 bits. Okay, you could say you have a probability out of a thousand, yes, but you will get max all the time. So if you do regular checks, the, the overall probability is very low. And given that we are scarce in bandwidth, we don't want to we didn't want to discard this very short uh, tax. We may transmit uh, longer tax when the service becomes operational, but at the moment the current spec is is like that. Another feature is that uh, instead of having one chain of keys per transmitter per transmitted uh, sorry transmitter you have one chain of uh, keys for all the satellites uh, one one, f one limitation that we have is that uh, in order to implement it quickly we can on we cannot touch the satellites or the data of OSNMA generated on ground and uh, it is transmitted only through what we call connected satellites so, so that means that only 20 out of 24 satellites will be transmitting uh, NMA then one thing we didn't talk about is uh, we said we are going to transmit the root key and we are going to authenticate it. But this root key has to be authenticated through another means. So this other means at the moment is ECDSA and in particular this, uh, this is, sorry, this ECDSA implementations that, uh, that you, can, uh, you can probably see there uh, for different uh, levels of security. Uh, we have had discussions on whether we should take into account uh, quantum uh, cryptography, quantum attacks or not. And at the moment, uh, we agreed to leave the spec as it is with ECDSA, consider it uh, secure for the moment, and then um, look at uh, how the cryptographic community is evolving. And uh <coughs> At a certain point, if we realize that it is necessary to replace ECDSA, but something that is uh, quantum secure, do it. But one of the advantages of Tesla is that the authentication of the root key is uh, not in the, uh, let's say, is not driving the performance because the performance is driven by the Tesla scheme, which is time delayed, uh, let's say, asymmetry, but using a symmetric, uh, symmetric scheme in reality. So, so symmetric schemes are more quantum. Uh, robust in the sense that uh, you just uh, have to increase the length of the key which doesn't have a big uh, impact in the in the performance and therefore you would be quantum uh, quantum secure so all this to say that uh, we can uh, we can afford to deal in the in the future with quantum threats without uh, sacrificing a lot of the performance of the scheme so this is the proposed uh, protocol it is currently under implementation we expect uh, to start finally signaling space now in 2019 sorry and uh, we don't discard to do any modifications uh, here well it is already a bit late so i won't uh, enter into the detail of the protocol just to say that this is how the the fields are uh, are divided you have one field that uh, transmits the max and the keys and you have another field that authenticates the root key regularly and it also allows to 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 change the um, the public key to renew the public key that you use to authenticate the root key. The idea is that uh, you maximize the over the air, what we call in SatNav over the air rekeying. So you don't need to the receiver to go back to the to um, to the factory or to connect to a server to uh, to continue using OSNMA. So we have this uh, key hierarchy with a Merkle tree that was proposed uh, here at uh, COSIC to authenticate uh, the ECDSA public keys, then the ECDSA public keys that authenticate the, the Tesla root key, then the Tesla root key authenticates the Tesla key, and then the Mac and the Tesla key authenticate the navigation data. Uh, this is uh, how the Merkle tree works. If you are familiar with it, then I don't think it's much necessary to go in detail. You basically create it at the beginning and then you you have the leaves of the tree, which are the different public keys that you use over the lifetime of the system. And then every time you transmit this uh, root uh, node that is known by the receiver, and then every time you transmit a new uh, key, you transmit the leaves that the, that the receiver doesn't have. Um, well, this is a bit more of detail of what the, what the root key is signing. So what, what the digital signature of the root key is signing, which uh, includes not only the root key itself, but also some features of the chain, but I won't enter in detail. On NMA performance, just to say that uh, the protocol is designed in a way that does not degrade at all the availability or accuracy of, uh, of Galileo. And we have done tests um, 
and uh, we see that even in urban environments, availability of uh, or accuracy remains the same. There is only one degradation in the time to fix of some seconds, which is unavoidable because you have to wait for the key to be transmitted after you get the MAC and the navigation. But uh, other than that, there is no performance degradation. And one of the reasons is uh, this one, that uh, the <coughs> bit error rate uh, that uh, you have for, uh, for uh, otherwise said, the, prob the probability of authenticating one satellite or getting the, the data of one satellite without authentication is the same because the authentication data overhead is so low compared to getting the data for that satellite that uh, it doesn't play a role that you have to, um, that you have to get some, some more bits. So therefore, we, as we knew at the beginning and then we have uh, tested, the impact in performance is, uh, is uh, negligible. Uh, where are we now? We have already developed uh, OSNMA, uh, the OSNMA module in Galileo. Uh, it uh, is being qualified at the moment. Um, we expect the authorization to transmit signal in space by the end of the year. And uh, we have already uh, several receivers with OSNMA, in particular, a pre commercial, the, the most advanced one is a pre commercial receiver that is implementing OSNMA for the smart tachograph, which is one application uh, of. Um, Satellite navi well, let's say the smart tachograph is a device that uh, that is sorry that is preventing uh, truck drivers to drive uh, over time, and it will use OSNMA. Uh, here is uh, some uh, some uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, the cooperation on OSNMA where uh, COSIC, in particular Vincent and Tomer, were involved. In particular, the confirmation of the functions and the sizes of keys and max, the public key management. There is also work going on to standardize Tesla as a lightweight uh, cryptographic protocol at uh, ISO. Um, not only uh, they have worked on uh, OSNMA, but they have also supported the authentication of uh, SBAS and EGNOS. SBAS are uh, uh, satellite-based augmentation system. So they basically provide integrity to GPS. We have one in Europe that is called uh, EGNOS and uh, we are studying adding authentication and, uh, and uh, COSIC has been cooperating on that. There may be others that I have forgotten. If so, sorry for that. And uh, there will certainly be others uh, to come, or we hope so. So uh, that finalizes the presentation. Thank you and don't hesitate to ask questions.